Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, welcome to our ninth Green Talk. And um, I'm honoured to be presenting uh, Ron Swenson today. Uh, Ron has, um, you know, a long history with San Jose State University. He taught courses in what was effectively this room uh, between 1965 and 1968. Um, he has uh, started non-profits and businesses. He um, has been a consultant um, working on problems to do with energy. He founded the International Institute for Sustainable Transportation. That's his uh, current non-profit. He writes um, a lot of blogs um, with perspectives uh, on energy. Um, he is a solar engineer by training. He has a, a Bachelor of Engineering Science and a Master's in Mechanical Engineering from Stanford. And uh, his uh, for-profit company is called Swenson Solar um, and they focus on commercial scale solar installation um, in the Santa Cruz and San Jose area. Um, he's also working with um, a student group um, in engineering at San Jose State University uh, called uh, Spartan Superway Project. And Spartan Superway Project is an opportunity for students to uh, get technical training working on problems. And um, over the five year age of this uh, project, about 200 students have been members and currently there are summer internships available through the Spartan Superway project and I'm sure Ron will be explaining this to you. So I'd like you to give uh, Ron Swenson a warm welcome. Thanks. Thank you very much, Josh. It's great to be here. I started out uh, working with Professor Furman, who's in the, near the front here, about five years ago. And uh, we developed a program, as uh, Josh just mentioned, Spartan Superway. Today I want to talk about Spartan Solar. And before I get too far into this, I want to talk about somebody who was here in the engineering auditorium uh, about 50 years ago when I first came to, onto the faculty as an instructor. Uh, Bucky Fuller is best known for inventing the geodesic dome. And this particular picture is of the dome that I saw at the World uh, Expo in, in um, Montreal in the summer of 1967. Beautiful structure, and it's very efficient in terms of enclosing space. Uh, later on, uh, when carbon-60 was discovered, they named it the Buckminster Fullerene because it so closely represents the, the design that he uh, used over and over again. And the only difference between this basic structure and the one you saw on the previous slide is that there were just more intersections and greater uh, detailing of that. So nanotech, please meet the soccer ball. Why is the soccer ball the same shape? Because this is the ideal way to enclose a sphere with, with rectangle, I mean with uh, geometric shapes. All right, so one thing that Bucky said when I was here 50 years ago is, I'll just read this for you, is now highly feasible to take care of everybody on Earth at a higher standard of living than any have ever known. It no longer has to be you or me. Selfishness is unnecessary. War is obsolete. It is a matter of converting the high technology from weaponry to livingry. And so when he said either war is obsolete or men are, I think he was putting us in, a, in an interesting direction. So now you can perhaps understand why I don't use bullets in my presentations. A lot of times when you see people giving a talk, there's all these uh, words, and I'm not here today to feed you a bunch of words over there, I'm where the words are. So listen to me, look at the pictures, and then if you want to know more about this method of presentation, which I strongly encourage you to do, and all the students in the Spartan Superway project are taken to using this method, the assertion evidence method. So there is my evidence <laughs> that I don't use bullets. All right, well, as you probably know, 
a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, there was a great challenge issued in Paris when all the leaders of the world got together and started talking about climate change. And now you've had uh, presentations before. Dr. Eugene Cordero gave a talk recently and explained how the conditions we face right now, if I show that again, the Earth is warming, and it may be possible in the anthropomorphine, anthropocene epoch coming that the planet will stabilize at a point below greenhouse conditions, that we'll be able to change to a new state, but it'd still be a state that is survivable. But if it goes too high, then the future of humanity is very much in question. So you've seen that, and also you know that there's been a lot of stirring for uh, the March on Science to help create awareness of the need, and those photographs were taken by Isaac um, Gensler, who is, uh, was organizing for San Jose State the March on Science last week. But I'd like to focus on what Bucky had to say. Somebody in the parade there was, was talking about Bucky saying we need to synergize. So talk about the opportunity. He said, you can never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So Paris, I started to mention earlier, was a key step for climate change action. And governments got on board. The world leaders issued that challenge. And then cities, regions, islands, and countries jumped on board. And the Western Cape in South Africa, South Australia, Scotland, and even Jerry Brown and uh, someone from Scotland, I don't know that person, uh, signed an accord to work together to come to terms with this. Mayors are getting involved. And Mayor Bloomberg, uh, now Secretary General, um, uh, special envoy, said cities are the, the drivers of progress and innovation. And through the compact of mayors, they can help nations set new aggressive climate targets over the next year. I think maybe you can see a pattern developing here. Uh, North Carolina, California has a plan that looks like this. Can we go from 100% fossil fuels to 100% renewables by a combination of reducing our power demand and by switching to renewable energy? Well, there's a senator, uh, Senator De Leon has a new bill to push for 100% renewables, and he was out recently uh, promoting this. Uh, industry is getting involved. Oh, but wait a minute. This guy is an expert who works for the United Nations. He says industry is really hard to decarbonize. Well, I say always listen to the experts. They'll tell you what you can't do and what can't be done and why. Then do it. <laughs> there you go. All right, so I know one industry group that is doing it. SSAB is an amazing company in Sweden making super high-strength steel, and they have decided to go carbon dioxide-free steel industry. They had a press conference recently, and at that press conference it was said, we're going to do it with renewables and not with nuclear energy. Sweden has quite a bit of renew uh, nuclear energy, but they're not going that way. 88 of the world's most influential companies are committed to 100% renewable power. Some of them here in the valley, Google, um, of course, Amazon, Department of Defense, Facebook, Walmart stores. Google is set to reach 100% renewable, and it's just the beginning. So they have a very um, elaborate program, and they've done a good deal to get this moving. By the way, uh, these slides are available online, so you won't have to uh, take detailed notes. Uh, many businesses, such as IKEA, have jumped on board. And most of their buildings, are, particularly their sales buildings, are all solar powered now. The world's largest brewer, now we can get serious about something here. You've probably seen these guys around. And actually, within the uh, Anheuser-Busch uh, re regime, uh, with Corona and uh, Modelo brands, they are leading the way within that group in Mexico. And of course, the Pope Francis is leading the way. And he says, in the end, everything has been entrusted to our protection, and all of us are responsible for it. Now, universities are getting involved. And just up the street in Berkeley, uh, UC President Janet Napolitano announced that UC is going to be carbon neutral by 2025. Now, I'm going to tell you something here. What they're really doing in this case isn't all that exciting to me. 
Because what they're saying they're going to do is go to the purchasing department and they're going to purchase renewable energy produced by somebody else. I've got another little different idea how we might go forward with that. Stanford has a group of students that are forcing with uh, uh, protest and so forth the board of trustees to stop investing in a portfolio that contains fossil fuel companies. And there are obviously places to go beyond that to actually building things, but at least there's a, a clear indication that there's something going on at Stanford. And I say if they can do it, so can we at San Jose State. And I say further that this transition of going from high carbon to zero carbon is a process and it isn't, isn't possible just to follow a curve. You have to also look at what can be done incrementally within each framework. And in the end, only individuals can do it. So when there was a presidential debate four years ago, five almost years ago, uh, President Obama and uh, uh, Governor Romney were having, a, a, uh, having it out. And the first person to ask a question that day was a young fellow named Jeremy. Uh, and he says, when I graduate, I have little chance to get employment, according to what his friends and people were telling him. What can you say to reassure me that I can get a job? And what Obama said is, we've got to make sure we're building the energy source of the future. Bingo. And uh, this was just in the New York Times a couple days ago. Today's energy jobs are in solar, not in coal. And looking at it in a little more detail, you can see that solar is quickly outpacing the others and has left coal in the dust. I guess that dust would be coal dust, wouldn't it? <laughs> All right. So let's get back to what Bucky had to say. He said that the best way to predict the future is to design it. And you people are unique in that regard within the framework of San Jose State and all the other students here because you are in the business of designing. That's what engineers do. So you're in a much better position to predict the future than most anybody else on this campus because you're engineers. And let's start looking at a few of the details. I'm just going to keep this simple. But I first point out that the best place to start is right here in this building, right here at home. And we need to know, first of all, how much solar could be captured on the roof of this building. And so if you're interested in taking this to the next step, that obviously would be one of the things to give a go. Oh, but wait a minute. There's another expert here. And you can see he's really upset. Solar energy is intermittent. Uh, hey, dude, where have you been for the last 500 years? <laughs> it actually was uh, discovered by, uh, what's that fellow's name? Copernicus, the, a Polish fellow. And he published this in 1543, that the Earth revolves around the sun. So what you might experience as intermittency, if you were out uh, just a few miles out in space, you look over there, and that sun ain't going away. It's all the time. So if the sun is always there, then it's up to us to discover how to deal with the fact that our Earth is spinning. And what Bucky said, but I keep coming back to him, the most important thing to teach your children is that the sun does not rise and set. It is the Earth that revolves around the sun. Everything else will follow. Okay? So obviously one of the big questions comes up, is how do we store that energy? Well, there are many options, and I show here on a page many, several of those options. And um, I also say that we need to know something about how much energy we're using and how to use it efficiently. I want to show you a chart. This was done by a group of high school kids down in, in the Galapagos. And if high school students in the Galapagos Islands with very limited access to tools and resources, certainly, College students at San Jose State in Silicon Valley can find the tools needed to figure out what's going on. So I saw this particular refrigerator where, let me walk over here and show you this graph. What's going on here? This is the normal pattern of cycling of a refrigerator, but it never goes below 100 watts. What was going on there? Well, I went downstairs after discussing this with the owner of the property. They had a refrigerator downstairs where they were storing 
Coke and 7-Up and stuff like this. And there was a glass front on this refrigerator, and it took 100 watts to keep the, the moisture from, from condensing on that, on that glass. And the gal said, well, you, there's a little button here. So I pushed that button, walked back upstairs, and a few minutes later, this is the pattern we got, the back to normal. So in the Galapagos Islands, you get about 10 kilowatt hours of electricity for a gallon of diesel. So just to make it possible for you and me to walk into the store there and see the bottle, jar, uh, probably a aluminum can, whether it was red or green, that was costing two barrels of diesel fuel a year. 42 gallons times two, 84 gallons. Isn't that amazing? Just to make it easy to see what's inside there. So we can find many ways to reduce electricity loads. And uh, last uh, week you had a talk by Max Dunn, and he talked quite a bit about how the smart grid comes into play here. So to put it in simple terms, there's an awful lot of engineering going on here that could make this very interesting. Well, uh, as mentioned before, I've been doing stuff with uh, students here, in, in, typically in their fourth year, um, and uh, with transportation. But other than what we're doing, the renewable energy advocates have not really figured out how to get transportation done with renewable energy. And I want to show you something here. Is that madness? Here's something else. This is Los Angeles, uh, Highway 405 at night. Is that madness? <laughs> I mean, can you believe that we in the 21st century are still living with these conditions and not doing something about it? Well, and back to the original point about carbon and global warming. Uh, if we look at the transportation sector, we see that it's about 28%. Industry, 24, and buildings, uh, the balance, a little under half. And so right now we have here in the valley what I like to call automation, fa automation fascination. And I was following on Monday afternoon, coming back from San Jose State, uh, I saw this Tesla. And you know, this car can go zero to 60 in three and a half seconds, right? I mean, this had run circles around the Corvettes that my friends were driving when I was in high school. The quick car. Well, what's quick about this car sitting at a stoplight? <laughs> I mean, give me a break. Remember what Bucky said. We've got to look at things differently if we want to get out of this mess. So here we have the Tesla car, but all those cars are in the parking lot. They spend 98% of their time sitting around rusting and 2% of the time actually running around taking people somewhere. I mean, what a waste. So I saw this presentation a few months ago by a, a guy that teaches business school up at Stanford, and he says, we're going to do so much better with automation. We're going to go from 17 to 20 percent efficient to get 90 to 95 percent efficient because we're going to switch to electric. And we're going to have better asset utilization. Well, he's saying that you can have a car out on the road 80 to 90 percent of the time. I suspend belief, you know. One of the things I tell students here in, uh, whenever I've had a chance to talk to uh, engineers here at San Jose State is that the biggest difference between you and others is that when you see a problem and somebody tells you something is true, you can get out your, your calculator and you can find out if it's true or not. So I call that a crap detector, excuse my French. But the best thing you come up with out of your four years here or, or more is that you will be able to tell when somebody's pulling your leg and when somebody's telling the truth because you know the laws of thermodynamics. And then they say that autonomy is going to be 100%. Everybody's going to have autonomous. But I'm going to see if we can flip the tables on them. Okay, so this is what you saw in the previous slide. Now, what if I did that? 
Well, wait a minute. Those people are hanging upside down. Let's see if we can straighten that out. Okay, is that a little better? <laughs> now you're happy? All right. So we flip it over, and then look what happens. We can have room for people, pets, petals, and petals underneath a transfer station system that's off the ground. So Spartan students are designing solar-powered, automated, rapid transit, ascendant, in other words, elevated, networks. That's what we're doing at Spartan Superway. And we're going to take a big chomp out of the energy use in the country. Now, right here, you can see where petroleum, about 35 quads a year, comes in to our economy. And a bit of it goes up into chemistry, you know, for making chemicals and things. But a big chunk of that goes here. And what happens to that 25 quads of, of um, oil there? Hmm. Well, 5.8, about 6, actually pushes the car forward. And 22 goes up in smoke. And that's what's causing our problems. So here at San Jose State, as, oops, I started to say, we just were at the uh, Paseo prototyping event a couple weekends ago and got on the front page of the local news with the work that's being done here on campus. And I'm thinking that for starters, what we can do is connect the two campuses, the main campus and the athletic fields down south of, uh, of the main campus here. And uh, give you an idea what it might look like, Here's a section of campus where you don't have cars. If you turn the camera and look the other way, you would see a city street. But this way, you see uh, these buildings. And when we put a transportation system in, it does not have to disrupt what's there below. It's a place that's walkable, that's enjoyable, and you don't have to be worried about uh, joining the 6,000 people who died as pedestrians in the United States last year. Let me see if I can tell you that again. Last year, in the United States, the most modern country in the world in the most modern century of the 21st, 6,000 people suffered from bad design. Bad design. Because we made it possible. So now we're going to have good design, and we're going to eliminate that safety challenge, that threat. And so here's just some pictures of what we've done over the last several years. Since 2012, uh, we've been displaying these at Maker Faire uh, in 2014, 2015. We got a fully automated unit established. Uh, we've had several uh, groups of students in the last two summers, and we're doing this again this summer. Uh, and the students from Sweden who came in uh, that year built a mock-up an exterior mock-up of what the car might look like. And then this was last year, 15-16, uh, where we again went back to uh, Maker Faire. And then this was summer of last year with students from Brazil, France, and, um, South Korea, and a few others. This was this year's team. And uh, in addition to those, we've involved students from several other universities in uh, in Europe and in uh, San Francisco, Illinois. So, there are three kinds of people in this world I want to tell you about. Those who make it happen, those who watch it happen, and those who wonder what happened. <laughs> All right, and so remember what Bucky said. The best way to predict the future is to design it. So what I've said up until now is that I would like you all to recognize the power of the individual. And I've been involved in doing things like this for many years. I worked with groups of students as early as 1972, building their own homes at the campus at UC Davis. And in the 90s, building a solar race car in Mexico with students there. So as I say a little later on in the presentation, this ain't my first rodeo. So I would like to think that you all have what it takes to figure out how we can get solar 100% on this campus. And instead of doing like what UC 
Berkeley and uh, System Wide is doing by just buying solar power from other people, you all can help us figure out how we can do it right here and turn this campus into a living lab. And that would give you all an amazing jump start on your careers because it is just very evident from what I've shown here that all around the world, people are starting to catch on. We have to get off of fossil fuels. The time is now, and it's only going to happen if people like you learn how to do it. And what better place to do it than right here in River City, right here in this building, right at home. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is to pair up with somebody you're sitting next to. And so just two people, and we're going to take turns. So first, I want the, you, you guys to decide which is which. And if you're sitting alone, like uh, in the second row here, you can maybe there's two, four, six. There's seven guys in that row, so like you can work with her. So you do a little math and figure out how you can turn this. You know, there's there's ten kinds of people in this world. Those who understand binary arithmetic and those who don't. So, <laughs> so there's only uh, all you have to do is pair up one on one. And what I want you to do first is to think up. The first person is going to just go crazy and say, well, what could possibly go wrong? What are the biggest obstacles for San Jose State to become solar powered, 100% renewable, and set an example to the world? After all, everybody looks to Silicon Valley, right? They look to Silicon Valley for leadership. And I want us to be able to demonstrate that leadership in a real way. So first person is going to tell us what obstacles you see. And then the second person is going to come up with designs to deal with those obstacles. I don't care what they are. You just keep thinking. And so I'll give you about five minutes. Then I'm going to blow the whistle. We're going to trade places. All right? Ready, set, go. Go. 